When a 160 IQ teen snaps. This this says it. When a 160 IQ teen snaps. Exclusive interview with the kill today. W Jesus Christ. GF, man, you changed. You now you only gamble, react, play games, and entertain me fully every day. Like, come on, brother, be more original. Oh, yeah. Alright. Alright, please. Alright. Is anyone else there? Where's the gun? Tony, don't do it. Tony, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it, Tony. I'm not a person, Tony. Jesus Christ, then. As far as human life in weird ways and meeting human life, circle, same same thing. Still, humans didn't act very smart. Caller? Caller. My ambulance is already on the way, okay? They are already coming. I need you to take a breath so I can tell you what to do to help, okay? All right, I need... Oh, don't move the gun. What do I need to do? Help me, please. Do not touch anything else other than what I am telling you to touch. Somebody needs to open the door. I have units on the scene. My son's trying to come again. Please, please. No, no. Chat. Okay, chat. Hold on, hold on. Yes, just one remark. One remark. Something I noticed, chat, is that dispatchers seem to get annoyed. Um, I understand that they have to remain kind of calm and kind of whatever because they're already sending people over, right? A lot of people don't don't realize this when people are watching these videos that the dispatchers are, they're already sending the help. They're already doing all that they can, right? At that point, they're just talking to the person to just get a little bit more information. Right? This is pretty much their goal to get more, more, more information and to kind of assess the situation to kind of help a little bit. But often enough, I don't have to be kind of monotone to just kind of help and whatever, but they seem to be so detached, almost sound annoyed. So I don't know what's up with that. Why do, why do they always sound, they're not being firm, they're sounding nonchalant and annoyed, which is odd to me. Somebody needs to open the door. I have units on the scene. My son's trying to come again. Please, please. No, no. Okay, hang on. Somebody go unlock the door. Hang on, no, please do. The 911 call you just heard was placed by James Allen Brazell just six days before Christmas in 2016 when he heard gunshots coming from somewhere in his family home. Allen raced through the house to find his stepdaughter, Ashley, and her 16-year-old brother, Sonny, standing over her with a gun in hand. His wife, Nicole, screaming in the background, Alan frantically called for help. As haunting as the 911 call was, the interrogation would turn out to be even more chilling. 16-year-old Sonny proves to be one of the most stoic and emotionless suspects we've ever seen. Really? It's hard to reconcile how someone like Sonny, with an IQ of 155 to 160, described as highly to exceptionally intelligent, has landed in this seat. When police arrived on the chat, I, I, I think the coolest we've seen chat is the guy with the guy with the hat, like the fedora, or whatever, right? That like killed some guy uh, from Walmart or some shit like that on his way. Uh, that guy, that guy, something else. Scene: They found the festively decorated exterior of the house, masking a horror scene inside. In an exclusive interview, Alan and Nicole Brazell recount what they can remember from that terrifying night. Later, we'll hear from Sonny himself. Ashley said she was going to go to bed. Sonny was going to go to bed. He's been awake, too, all day and at work. So everybody was kind of tired. Alan was already, I think, in the bedroom. I think he came and told everybody good night. I went straight into the room. I just heard her put on my robe, and I think Ashley was going to go ahead and eat some soup that I had cooked. As soon as I go to sit down on the bed, the light's already off in the bedroom, I hear what I think is firecrackers. It's all my mind. Pop, 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 firecrackers. Sonny being such a mild kid and Ashley being, they both were kind of like little professors, responsible kids. They got great grades in school. I know that I bought firecrackers for New Year's Eve. And I'm thinking, I cannot believe one of them let off firecrackers because I hear Ashley say, Sonny, very surprised, in shock. That's all I hear through the door. And then I hear firecrackers. So I throw back on my robe. I don't have clothes. I throw back on my robe. Alan jumps up. And I, so I go to go outside. I mean, I am furious. Like, what? Are, who let off Chat, let's not fucking like focus too much on her smiling, whatever, chat. People deal with like trauma and very um, heavy events in a lot of different ways that we don't really fathom or can understand, especially when something that this gravity can, can happen. No, some people laugh like when they talk about the stuff that happened to them. Uh, it's just how, how it goes. Firecrackers in the house. What? I can't even believe they would do this. Either one, I don't even think either one would do it. I was closest to the door going out into the hallway. And so whenever I heard it, you know, pretty much immediately I knew what it was, you know, because I am a country boy. Uh, I'm a country boy. I'm a hunter and I have guns and I've always had guns. 
So I immediately knew what it was, but I didn't put it that it was somebody from in the house. Like I asked there, Sonny, I thought somebody had came in the house, you know, like a break in. So I immediately reached down and grabbed my handgun and started toward the door. And something told me, don't take your gun out there. And of course, you know, you have these conversations with yourself really, really fast. Like, are you crazy? I'm not going out there because I knew it was gunfire. And I'm like, I'm not going out there without some kind of protection. You know, heard it again, pretty much, you know, don't take your gun out there, put it down. So I put the gun down and I kind of tossed it on the bed and headed out the door. And when I got there, I immediately saw Sonny standing there and he had a gun in his hand. Of course, I didn't know where he got the gun because it was a Christmas present that I didn't know about. So I yelled at him. I said, Sonny, I said, put the gun down. From who, though? He was immediately obedient, as he always was. And he leaned down, he put the gun down, and I kind of grabbed him by his shirt and kind of scooped. Wait, but from who, though? It was for the dad? Scooted him or slung him over to the side up against the hallway there, and I said, you stand right here. I said, do not move. Oh, it was from the wife to the guy, probably. He did. He just stood there. He didn't say anything, but he stood there. So we went to check on Ashley. That's when she this went in This is all in a matter of, like, right. instant seconds. I'm like, Ashley, Ashley, because I see no... I don't realize... That I'm still looking for, like, a firecracker damage. I know this sounds strange, but the mind... You know, like, I'm still stuck on firecrackers. It was at this point that Sonny's stepfather rushed back to the bedroom to find his cell phone and call for help. That exact minute, I guess, Sonny bends down, picks up that gun again. It's on the ground. He's a little bit away from it. I have pulled Ashley from the couch, not being a, I'm a tall gal, but she was only about five foot five, lightweight. But I try to get her, pull her from the couch. And I realize he's, Sonny's grabbed the gun. He runs to our bedroom. So I start screaming for Alan. Oh my God. Sonny, don't do it. Sonny, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it, Sonny. I'm not a person, son. Don't well, do it. This man runs through the house and runs to the bedroom. Sonny, you know, and he took off to the bedroom and I turned around and I saw him go to the bedroom. I started toward the door. Sonny had ran around our bed to the furthest point away from the doorway. He was staring straight ahead at the door, but he was trying to change the clip in the gun, to change the magazine in the gun, because he had shot everything out of the first clip whenever he was in the living room. He's holding the gun. He's holding both of the magazines in his hand. And, and he's not looking down to see what he's doing. Clip. And of course, he had never. Yeah, yeah, he corrected himself. He said magazine after chat. Okay, stop it. Guys, it's a magazine because I saw the fucking clip from a fucking moist critical guy. I handled this gun before. I get it. It's a magazine. You know, yeah. so by the time I ran over there, he pushed the magazine into the gun and he stuck the gun up to my chest from where I was at at this point in time. I was up right in front of him, you know, and I was fixing to grab a hold of him. And, and he was just kind of staring straight ahead and he just started pulling the trigger. He had put the same magazine back in that he started with that was empty. If he had gotten the right magazine, I wouldn't be here today. I would, you know, I definitely wouldn't have made it. And so I snatched the gun and everything out of his hands. What and the I grabbed fuck? Him and just kind of walked him into the living room <laughs> and set him on the little love seat, and he was kind of looking over the living room where Nikki was still in there with Ashley on the floor. And he's still in dad mode. He says, sit right there and don't move, which is shocking to me because of <clears throat> the situation. And the most wicked, horrible, heart-trembling, terrorizing thing happened. I'll, I'm doing this, and I look up. He's, he's trying to unlock the door so then the police come and get a towel. And I mean, I'm frantic. His eyes are all the dark. Suddenly, now this is someone I've been with just 30 minutes, this is my son, right? We've all been eating and snacking and on a video chat. Everything around here has become dark black. And the, the voice that comes out of the mouth what? says, because I'm, I'm literally hysterical at this point, I'm screaming, what happened? Ashley, answer me, because there is no, I mean, you would think if a whole clip, right? She would be, there'd be blood, right? There's none. I'm screaming, Ash, what happened? What happened? What happened? I hear the most darkest, deep voice say, she can't talk to you. She's dead. When uh, police finally arrived to take control of the scene, oh they found bullets behind the couch and in the storage drawer beneath it. 
The gun was found in the master bedroom, where Sonny's stepfather had left it after taking it from him. Police were put in the peculiar predicament of having both a suspect and weapon already established before they arrived. As paramedics raced to save Ashley's life, investigators arrested Sonny Kim and took him to be questioned before he learned his sister's fate. Please note that throughout the interview, police addressed Sonny by his middle name, Christopher. The following never-before-seen footage has been analyzed by a qualified team, including a licensed professional counselor, a licensed clinical psychologist, and a licensed attorney. Sonny spends a good deal of his time waiting to speak with officers, conversing with himself. While the audio isn't easily discernible, he appears to be talking about computers. Yeah, well, is there a top? Uh, it's supposed to be, I think it's a computer. It's supposed to be $500 for the R7 or whatever. Uh, the match speed of 600K. Hey, Christopher. Hey, my name's Josh. I'm calling me Josh. I'm investigating with Columbia County. How you doing, man? Oh, okay. In Georgia, a minor may be taken into custody during a lawful arrest. Georgia law states that a law enforcement officer taking a child, or in this case, 16-year-old Sonny, into custody, must promptly notify the parent, guardian, or legal custodian about why the child is being brought into custody. Once in custody, if the police want to question the minor, they may do so without the parent present, as there doesn't appear to be a definitive law that states parents must consent to interrogation of their minor child. While police may interrogate the minor without parental consent, the court will still determine if any statements made under a Miranda waiver are admissible. With this all in mind... Damn, dude, that, that sounds fucking crazy that you leave it up to the court or whatever. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing that, that they... Okay, it's fine. So the officer is free to get to the heart of the matter. He jumps right in and asks about the victim, Sonny's sister, Ashley. Tell me about your sister. Uh, Ashley Kim. I think she was 2022. She lived in Colorado. She was. She was recently. Yeah, she recently broke up, lost her job, broke up with boyfriend. I think someone was. Who it is? Uh, she moved. She came back over here for Christmas. Okay. After attending a concert in Atlanta, which she remembered. Three days ago, I believe she left something like that. As far as Ashley goes, uh, that's it. I. Any particular information? Chillingly, Sonny uses the past tense when yeah, discussing she was, his yeah. sister, even though he has no way of knowing her current medical status. I mean, has she been in town long? Um, only for a few days. When did she move out of Colorado? Uh, I believe it was like about a year ago ish. And okay. she got a job, I think, as a secretary or something about this one. Yeah, right. I think as a secretary. Paperwork stuff. Paperwork stuff, boring stuff, right? Yeah, so things like that. I understand. The officer switches back to asking about Sonny. Just like when he was asked about his sister, Sonny gives a superficial, impersonal answer. From what I, from what I gather, you have, a, you have a job you work and you've already kind of graduated high school. Yes. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Uh, 16 years old, male. Stating that he's 16 years old male is a highly atypical manner of speech and an indication that Sonny may be completely detached from what just happened with his sister since this description of himself seems to be made in third person. Where did you go to, where did you go to high school? Uh, I was some sort of Okay. And then you uh, finished up and taking some classes at GMC? Yep. All right. And do you have chat. a job? Yes. Chat. Where do you work? I, guys, I gotta be honest, chat, because I feel like this is something that even happens in schools where they ask like, yo, uh, tell us your name and present, present yourself. What, 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 what do you say, chat, when people say, present yourself? Do you even know what to say? I don't know what to say. Most people that I know don't know what to say. Is the people are just go like, um, I, uh, I, uh, I play games at the computer. Um, here's my name. Uh, computer. It doesn't games. mean that it's your. Do you really? Name, yes, I'm Washington. Bro. I've been there a couple times. Really nice. Good, good service over there. Always been pleased with uh, the work that I've done on my computers. Notice how intense his eye contact is. Normally, this can be an indication that someone is watching to see if the other person accepts what they're saying especially in the case of a lie, as someone wants to see if they're being believed. But Sonny has no reason to be looking for acceptance given what he's saying. Instead, this might indicate that he has some kind of social skills deficit, and he's been taught to make eye contact rather than naturally making some eye contact as part of typical conversation. 
he comes across as robotic so far. Here we see the officer once again attempting to connect with Sonny on a personal level by establishing common ground and building rapport. Just like before, though, Sonny doesn't appear to care and does not respond as the officer had likely hoped. With that technique rendered pointless, the officer is forced to ask Sonny more direct questions, and his response is disturbing, to say the least. I wanted to talk to you about the events that happened tonight, okay? Can you walk me through everything that happened tonight, Christopher? Kind of start at, well, I'll start at the beginning. Sure. Uh, so, I suppose the beginning is yes. Uh, well, a bit of pretext, I suppose. Okay. Uh, we had planned to get uh, my father a new 1911 uh, 45 caliber pistol. Uh, about a week ago, we picked up from the academy. Uh, I, we were hiding in my room, and Joey could uh, package it and put it under the tree. Uh, basically, well, this not yesterday night, uh, but uh, earlier, uh, I forget. What did you? A couple, uh, couple hours ago? Yeah, a couple hours ago. It's not comparable, but. All right. This interaction. All right, chat. I'm gonna fucking say it, chat. A bunch of fucking NA unhinged people are gonna get mad at me, dude, for talking about gun laws, dude. You know, dude, the way that they have it here in Canada, dude, the, the, gun, the gun laws, most of this shit would have been impossible if they, if they was according to the, to the sort of guidelines that fucking um, Canada has around how you lock the gun, where you put the keys, how detached the bullets have to be, the mag, the gun, the way they have to do all this shit. Every time we've seen things with guns, it seems like it would have been impossible to do any of this shit. Um, with that in place, which is so simple. And if people say, it's my first, dude, it's my amendment, right? I get to protect myself. That's cool, dude. If you, about, if you care about having a gun, then you probably won't care that much about having detached parts in your house and having certain guidelines about, around it. And you just won't care because that's just, that's just how it is. If you're a gun enthusiast, you just have your gun. You just have your whatever you want, but you just have to kind of be, be safer about it, which is not a real problem. ...shows that Sonny may not be oriented to time, which could be considered typical given the stress of the situation. He may not show any over- it's, You're saying it's impractical? Well, it seems that any you said that it's impractical it seems to be practical for somebody who wants to kill you instead or you to kill yourself with it. That's, see, that's, that, that is something people often forget is that not because you have a gun, that the gun is for fucking, is only for you. Your name is not on it. Like, guns will be used against you and uh, uh, that's just how, bro, when people understand this, like- Bert signs of distress but the way he described himself a couple of minutes ago, plus his lack of awareness of exactly when he shot his sister, are indications of emotional distress. Uh, walked out of the room with the gun loaded. First magazine was the one with the extended grip, eight rounds in it. Uh, well, there was seven rounds in it, and then one in the chamber, and then the second mag in my left pocket. Uh, this one here was seven rounds in it. In your, in your left pocket? Yes. Front pocket or back pocket? Uh, front pocket, but... Uh, I also had a pair of gloves on, uh, yes, a pair of, uh, work gloves-ish, uh, Velcro. Oh, dude, these are classic gear. gloves, though. Sonny is clearly a detail-oriented guy, as he describes his gloves. Sometimes, suspects may provide these types of unnecessary details out of nervousness and their desire to cooperate with the interrogation process. Sonny must at least be aware that he's in trouble, so it makes sense that he wants to be cooperative. At the same time, his mention of being male and the other details he's provided thus far could also give us a clue as to his personality type, possibly very rigid and perfectionistic. Uh, after that, I walked up to the living room and I turned left. I saw my sister and I put uh, about eight rounds into her chest from here, torso. Sonny says, ish again. This also indicates his high degree of rigidity and precision in the way he thinks and speaks. Sonny also maintains his highly formal and rigid manner of speaking, as if he was providing step-by-step -step instructions to someone or telling a story. He's markedly detached from the actual event. His voice remains even, and he still is showing no signs of overt stress. Uh, after that, uh, my, both of my parents uh, ran from their bedroom door. I came up and stared behind the door, held both the gun and the Dude, Chad, it seems to be a little bit maybe overanalyzed, but I'm not going to go too over it. Uh, maybe I'm not going to go too crazy in details about it. It's just, I feel like um, some events that happened in my life that were maybe a little bit traumatic, the way that I recounted those events to myself and or, or talked about it is almost exactly like that. Nice, my hands. Uh, and and maybe it's like a coping mechanism, but I don't know. Me after they come out. Uh, Mother, my mother rushed to, um, to my sister's party. My father started calling 9-11, uh, or 9-1, uh, 
The way that Sonny presents being really out of touch with reality and definitely out of touch with emotions and empathy is similar to another case, that of Michael Hernandez. Michael told investigators that he wasn't angry when he killed his friend, Jaime Goff, but that he wanted to try murder. Um, I was planning to murder. And is there any specific reason why you planned this? No, there's not. And well, this guy died of fat. Uh, yes, uh, so the gun was left on the ground. I uh, believe about 10 to 20 seconds after he started calling, uh, he walked away and I went for the gun and grabbed the extra magazine from my pocket. However, I'm not very skilled in firearms, so uh, I didn't load the magazine correctly and was able to chamber around, attempted to shoot my father, once, and then I uh, sort of was paying, just feigned putting the gun down and then tried to shoot again. Not very good at the farm, so I didn't, I wasn't able to kill him. But after that, uh, yes, I took the gun away from me. I sat back down on the couch, uh, waited for them to arrive, uh, basically the whole process of them, uh, tending to sister's wounds. Uh, after I came back, she was pulled off on the ground. Yes, and then uh, that's when the, all the police arrived. I was put in cuffs and carried up in a squad car. And after that, a uh, while after, I can't remember what order it was either five. Oh, so his dad said that he loaded the same mag back to them, but he says that he loaded the correct mag, but he just couldn't couldn't put it in properly? I call the ambulance right, but mm -hmm. that's just, you know, uh, basically. Why well, am I right? Sonny explains everything in a very distanced way including his own arrest, as if he's completely detached from the world around him. Depersonalization involves feeling detached from oneself, as if observing one's thoughts, emotions, and actions from a distance. Fair enough. Other this symptoms include feeling emotionally numb, disconnected from one's surroundings, and experiencing memory difficulties. Sonny makes no effort to hide his intentions either. He references his sister's body instead of calling her by name. Again, at this point in time, Sonny doesn't know whether she's dead or alive. He also openly admits to trying to shoot his father twice. He could have taken the opportunity to claim he had a change of heart in an effort to potentially look better, but instead admits that he wanted to and would have shot his father if the gun had not stopped working. Oh, did you... Unfortunately, there's no other information about why exactly the gun stopped working. Chillingly, he shows absolutely no remorse and continues to sound cold, detached, flat, and methodical. He might as well be describing how to put a computer together piece by piece. When you were putting, when you were putting the, uh, the magazine into, into the weapon and chambered around, what, what, were your, what was your plan? Uh, initially, uh, the, uh, my idea was uh, kill father, mother, sister in order of uh, threat. So for some reason, though, I didn't go along with that. I'm not sure. Suppose I didn't really act the way I was planned. For some reason, Sonny ranks his family in order of threat. It could be assumed that he means he intended to kill them in order of who was best equipped to disarm and stop him. Yeah, that's what he meant, yeah. But that isn't necessarily true. The officer will have to follow up on this later. For now, though, he lets Sonny maintain his train of thought, and it's important that the interrogator doesn't interrupt once they get a suspect talking. This is because it allows them to get their full, uninfluenced account of what happened. And the interrogation only gets stranger. And uh, the idea was walking to the bedroom. Both parents were either sleeping or resting. So father, your mother, and then walk out into the living room and kill her. Uh, you know, order of the smack to forget, I forget the word, but uh, anyway, that was the plan. However, uh, as wait, far as humans are- Wait, 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 They missed a small thing right here, hold up. Bit the word, but uh, any her, uh, you know, order of that smack to three I forget the word, but uh, yeah, it seems it seems like he he kind of almost like rehearsed it, almost like he like he wrote it somewhere, or he said it on like a maybe like a like a video diary or something like that, because he seems like he knows the word that was supposed to be there, but he doesn't remember it. Anyway, you get it? Hand. However, uh, as far as humans, you I can though? and me than human, I'm the same same thing. And it's why I wore the gloves is because I figured my hands would get sweaty being right. humans. Uh, Neurosis and humans and such, so I wore them so you know I would be able to maintain my grip on the weapon and such. Uh, however, uh, still, humans didn't act very smart in a way. Uh, uh, basically, I, I looted all the rounds. I meant to only put one or two in there, but 
don't know, I'd never shot someone before, so they seemed like blanks. I mean, basically nothing. I didn't, couldn't do with any understandable impact or uh, anything. So I suppose I just kept on shooting, and then after that, uh, I put walked up to the well, and uh, moved to the my pants store and stood there with you know weapon in my right hand, right, and then uh, magazine in left hand, and then I dropped them on the ground. Nicole Brazel, Sonny's mother, ran an embroidery business out of the house, teaching textile arts to students. His stepfather, Alan, had accepted Sonny like his own son. Sonny's sister, Ashley, was known to be outgoing and had been enjoying her time at college in Colorado. In the sixth grade, Sonny asked his mother if he could drop out of school, in large part because he felt bored. He was homeschooled for a while, and at 13, he started working for a company who his mother had a contract with before working at a computer store. At 15, he started Holy. at the Georgia Military College, where he completed high school classes alongside college classes. Altogether, they appeared to be the picture of a happy family. In an exclusive interview, Sonny talks about his childhood in more detail and about his relationship with his mother and sister. My biological father left the country and went to Seoul, Korea, and my mother kept us afloat tooth and nail, and she fought for us. Prior to my incarceration, I was actively working at computer exchange and taking classes at GMC, and I was, I suppose, living a good life. I was always provided for, I was always taken care of, and I had loving parents every step of the way, and she got us out of debt. Eventually, we were, you know, a stable household. She met Alan, and, you know, he's a great guy. So I, I have had a really wonderful set of parents. I don't think I could have asked for. I owe everything to them. Every, pretty much everything good in my life, but they've been responsible for in some way, shape, or form. Ashley was uh, the bigger sister. She had the kindest heart out of all of us. She actually got a lot of our kindness. I'm not sure what I got. I lean on her a lot for a lot of things. She was, between her and my mother, they were the only two stable things that I really had in my life. Ashley Bro. was someone who could always come through, and she was always put together. I could always trust her judgment. Uh, I I'll I just wait till they say her, why. The, you know, no. she had a real heart. I love that about her. He was her favorite out of everybody, and she was his it. favorite. They had the most in common. They were both very smart, very high IQs. Yet Sonny manages to erase all of that personality and all of that love in the interrogation room. This clinical and detached way of speaking appears to be a symptom of depersonalization, which is closely related to dissociative amnesia and dissociative identity disorder, uh, two very serious mental illnesses. Okay, that's tough, but all, okay, listen, chat, yes, yes, I'm not a professional chat, but I think one that has, has value here. Since he did get incarcerated though, he could have modified his speech and his vision and the way he sees these things, right, to appear a certain way after the fact. Or maybe he's he got like therapy or some shit like that, and he sees things in a different way than, than before when he was in this integration. That's just how it is. Like there's no anger here, no emotion at all, and no indication that he had major issues with his family. It's almost like he was possessed and is now just describing what he saw. He's speaking like the lights are on, but nobody's home. I suppose I just saw her and I not I didn't recognize her as a son, but shot the first person I saw, I suppose. Mm -hmm. uh, not a reaction, obviously, yeah. actually did not. Not the way I intended to, as I didn't make enough room or take into account, you know, the way humans act. Right. They mainly me, as far as humans go, yeah. so. With Sonny so forthcoming regarding the details of the crime, well, the investigator seeks to confirm what Sonny's stepfather, Alan Brazell, told them about the crime. When your father went to chase after you, uh, in the bedroom. That, what bedroom was that? Uh, it was the, it was the largest bedroom. It's the master bedroom, the one where they sleep. Okay. So, yeah, had a large king-size bedroom. And, and you, you told me that you had, at that point in time, you had, you had dropped the weapon. And, yes. then, and then you reached out and picked it up about 20 seconds later. Uh, it was about two, three feet, uh, about a meter away from me. What's right. So I went from the couch, grabbed it, and then ran off. And then, then she had taken the magazine from my pocket and, well, what were you trying to do when you ran away? Uh, my plan was to grab the weapon and load the magazine and shoot my father. And then shoot my mother. Okay. And 
No, sh no shots. And, and, and caught you in the bedroom. Yes. And you did not have a chance to load the magazine at that point in time? Or like, what happened at I didn't believe it. If you could not fucking load a mag into that bitch, he was never gonna be able to load fucking bullet into this piece of shit. Then no, absolutely zero shot as he was gonna do anything with that. I, I fumbled with it. And I did load it into the gun, not all the way though. All right. So I wasn't able to pull back the hand all the way. Uh, so I'd slide back all the way. Uh, the second time after I feigned, uh, putting the gun down after he told me, you know, don't do it, etc. Uh, after I put it back, I tried to uh, send the magazine back in with the back of my wrist about here, right. uh, and then pull the slide back out, but that didn't uh, solve it either. So uh, he ended up uh, taking the firearm away from me okay. and then walked back to the living room. Did, uh, did you attempt to pull the trigger while he was coming at you? Yes. Okay. Both times. Both times. Yeah. And both times, it, it failed to fire. Is yes. That right? Okay. And that's when your father caught up with you and, and took the weapon from you. Okay. Did, did you say anything to him after that? Or, or, or what happened after, uh, after, after I, he got the weapon from you? Uh, after that, uh, I basically, uh, he walked he right back into the living room, uh, put the gun down on the ground, uh, across the living room, away from the couch where I was sitting, which was uh, red. Oh, see, I leave my chance. Parents called it. Uh, it was a red couch, and you, uh, and you placed it on the other side, and then helped my mother in attending to my sister's wounds. But, uh, after he put the gun down the ground, I did consider either running to my room where there was a dude room exactly shot or running for the gun. Bro, How I was about to say, I was about to say earlier, why didn't he like, like like tie him up or some shit? Like Jesus Christ, dude! I didn't act on either, so I figured my chances were low of getting either done. So I didn't think it was worth it. With Sonny's confession recorded in more than sufficient detail. Leak flare? Why? Wounds. After he put the gun down the ground, I did consider either running to my room where there was a little shot. Wait, 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 wait. What the fuck? I did consider either. Should I stream or not? Dude! Why did they blur his? Why did they blur out his rank, dude? They, they didn't blur his. I am. I am. I'm, I'm OPGG in chat. I'm fucking. I'm going full brain dead mode. Silver white guys. Is it actually him? Nah, the profile picture is different. They have no way it's the same guy. Yeah, no, it's the same guy, right? His name is Half Blurred. Oh, is, is he missing? I mean, it's the same capitalization, though. Guys, it's the same capitalization, though. I'm confused. Anyway. Running to my room where there was a really shotgun or running for the gun. However, I didn't act on either, so I figured my chances were low of getting either done, so I didn't think it was worth it. With Sonny's confession recorded in more than sufficient detail, we can now tackle the question of why Sonny decided to undertake oh, such unprovoked violence. What were you thinking about? What, what made you want to kill your sister and your parents tonight? What, what's been going on? Um, well, it's pretty good, actually. Uh, I've got a job, had classes, it's going pretty well. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, nothing really is bad when that thing to me. Nothing, a pretty good thought. nothing bad, you just wanted to do it? What the fuck? Had classes, so it's I going la pretty well. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, nothing really is bad when that thing to me. Nothing, a pretty good thought. nothing bad, you just wanted to do it? Uh... Not even want. I just did. Okay. Let's back up. Excuse me. A few minutes ago, we were talking about when you were loading the, uh, the putting the rounds in the magazine, and then loading that magazine into your weapon, and you said that the initial plan was to go to your parents' room and then shoot them first, and then go into your living room where your sister was and then shoot her. Yes. What made you deviate from that plan? I don't know. I when I, I first saw my sister and. Mm -hmm. The first thought, I suppose, was, I don't know, uh, I, I was supposed to go to my parents' room and kill uh, father and mother, but I saw my sister, and for some reason I 
don't know why I I live in magazine and do it at Costco. Is there any reason why you'd wanna why you wanna kill everybody? I mean, did they did they hurt you? No. Have they made life miserable for you? Are they abusive to you physically? Got no one. None whatsoever. There there was no reason for it. It just uh, I can think of. In two words, Sonny provides what could be very important information. I, I'm actually if he had been it. abused as a child, this may give some insight into his detached behavior, as ongoing physical abuse is often the accepted explanation behind pathological dissociative behavior or disorders. This could be in reference to Sonny's biological father, who was allegedly neglectful. But Sonny doesn't elaborate, so the officer tries honing in on a different part of the crime. What made you want to kill your mother and father? There wasn't really any motivation for it. Actually, uh, one thing, oh yeah, no, no, I told you about uh, trying to shoot my father and then failing and then trying again to get my mom. Um, yeah. But as far as motivation for killing my parents, uh, none really existed. Uh, my father did... Uh, a lot of the chores. My mother worked quite hard at her job. It's my fan as loud as it's recording. Uh, my mother had her job. I mean, they, we all had a relatively good life. I'll mute it. Did you get a sense of satisfaction when when this was going on? Uh, no, I didn't really feel anything. And your mother was tending to your sister's wounds, like you said, and you were considering that when she was asking you, why did you do it? Uh, no, I didn't really feel anything. And your mother what, was tending to your sister's wounds, like you said, and you were considering that when she was asking you, why did you do it? Did that a number of times. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, what was running through your mind when, when she said that? At the moment, it, the only thing that I was thinking of really was I had the gun and, that, and then after, you know, uh, I had the gun of shotgun in my room passed through my mind. I didn't really think of much, but it's just sort of... You were in, you were still in your plan mode of, can I get a weapon and kill mom and dad? Yes. Is, is that what you were thinking? Yes. Did that make you happy? Uh, no. Uh, I, I Did it make you sad? No, I didn't really feel much. It just sort of happened. Do you have any idea why it just happened? Uh, nah, this guy's, oh, he, he's not saying everything. He's, he's trying to look like he's being deliberate about it. He's not. The, I feel like if he had this whole plan in his head to carry out, and he felt like that after the first kill or whatever, then, then why was he still thinking about going, going for the other gun? Why was he still thinking about all this, these other things then? This, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up know. at all. Not really. Okay. Um, Sonny's answer of not really here is interesting. He actually seems to not understand it himself. No, I was going to say that not fifteen percent of itself to kill my family, and I just did for no reason. But having had weapons in my uh, room for basically one or two years now, that's you know I've had the opportunity for a while. Well, why did you decide tonight? Uh, tonight was I suppose it was a bit spontaneous. Yeah, uh, I thought it was six days to Christmas or something like that. But uh, that mother, my parent, my mother would come in and you know uh, have wrapped the gun the next day or something along those lines. So I figured. The likelihood of her wrapping the gun the next day is fairly high, so right. I said now I still have access to the firearm. Even though Sonny's rationale for committing the crime tonight is disturbing, it still doesn't entirely make sense. Even if the gun had been wrapped and placed under the Christmas tree, Sonny would have still had access to it and multiple other firearms he could have used in the attack. Is this something you thought about doing for a while, or is this something that you've been thinking about for the past couple minutes? It was sort of... And impulsive and not really something I've considered before. Here, Sonny expresses an impulsive element to his actions, which supports the fact that he may struggle to differentiate between his thoughts and the reality of acting out his thoughts. What ultimately made you decide to, to shoot your sister in the chest? I don't know. Something in my, I, I can't remember what it was, but something in my mind basically led to me uh, loading the gun and that, what was it doing? Something interesting happens when Sonny tries to talk about what was going through his mind in the moments before the shooting. Well spoken up to this point, Sonny starts to stumble over his words, giving only partial thoughts and attempting to start his sentence over. Something in my, I can't remember what it was, but something in my mind basically led to me. When he isn't able to describe what he thought or felt, 
he reverts to talking about the physical details. Uh, we basically ended up blowing the gun, and after the gun was loaded in my bedroom, I walked out. And I suppose at that point, I, I don't know what I was thinking, but I uh, suppose I just shot it. I don't really have much of an explanation. Okay. But what emotions were running through you when this was going on? <clears throat> Not much. Were you happy? Were you sad? Or I did you care? Just kind of stood there, I suppose. Okay. The stuttering and stumbling over emotional words is likely a sign of anxiety, so he retreats back into the world of dissociated details. This could be due to a lack of comfort or understanding of emotions to begin with. Do you think you have to be killing your family? It's it's wrong, dude. Uh, it is. It is. I, I, he, 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 here's here's my my thought, and then we ask more. Here's what I think happened in in this situation. He just he just rethought about the event, and he remembers what he was thinking about at, at the time. And he just forgot his recollection. So he just he he knows he knows someone in his head as he's explaining it, but he doesn't remember at this point. It's why he's, he's stumbling. It's so That's it. Morally wrong. Right. And didn't you think you were going to get in trouble if that was to happen? Yes, I was certainly going to be apprehended by the authorities. Okay, but you still went through with it anyways. Yes. Why? I don't know. Uh, either it was out of curiosity, boredom, or something else chillingly curiosity or boredom could have very well been the case as sonny admits although he seems to lack empathy there's a degree of self-awareness here when a person lacks empathy there is little to no attention placed on how another person would feel the presence of empathy is critical because it is in large part what directs moral decision making without it someone like sonny may just act on impulse or out of sheer curiosity or boredom Sonny identifies over and over that he doesn't understand why he did this. It's just sort of happened. I don't really either, it's either I don't remember or I'm suppressing memory or there is no reason. Okay. Uh, getting towards this, there's not really much of a reason. It's sort of like being impulsive about You knew you were going to get in trouble. Yes. You knew it was wrong. Yes. You knew you were going to get caught, mm -hmm. but you didn't care. Uh, yes. Altogether, the detective interviewing Sonny has acquired a significant amount of evidence. The only remaining missing puzzle piece motive, is yeah. the motive. With enough material to charge Sonny, the question of his motive will be left to be uncovered during trial. All right, well, give me just a minute, I'll be right back, okay? After the officer leaves, Sonny immediately goes back to talking to himself. Well, no, see, the 1060 would be... I was thinking it as a stranger. Oh, no, 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 yeah, we moved on from computers. It was Holden. Enzo. No, not Enzo. Uh, Ryzen? Ryzen. That's what it's called. Ah, uh, that's a stranger. Uh, his new uh, DDM4, DDR4, etc. architecture. I can't remember what their chips had names. Yeah, the, the chips had names were really just important. I can't remember what they were. I think it was like... I don't know what it was. Yes, yeah, so... DDR4 of the age. I'm Bro, I hate when they do this. I think, dude, I, dude, we watch this all the time. I hate when they do this. I, I, it's just so cringe. Sort of myth, but I don't know. It only takes three minutes for the officer to return and tell Sonny what charges he will officially be facing. All right, Christopher, you are going to be arrested, okay? You're going to be arrested for murder. Yes. Murder for your sister. Uh, aggravated assault on your father for trying to shoot him as well. And then possession of a weapon here in the commission of a felony, okay? You expect all that, though, correct? Yes. Okay. Well, we're going to move forward uh, it, it, with the charges. And I want to let you know that that's, as of right now, what you're going to be charged with, okay? Okay. So just hang tight. Okay. So I'm going to be with you shortly, and we'll get this underway as far as getting you transported to the jail and booked and everything like that, okay? Okay. All right. Tragically, Ashley Kim succumbed to her injuries before the paramedics arrived. Emergency services attempted to resuscitate her but they were unsuccessful. She was declared dead on the scene shortly after Sonny was arrested. In our conversation with Sonny's parents, they remembered their daughter fondly. She was the pretty girl that was nice. unmistakably yeah. not a mean girl. Yeah, she wasn't a mean girl. She had a good heart. Um, a good there's heart. a lot of people that spoke at her funeral that said, you know, Ashley didn't have to be nice to me, but she did. She didn't hold grudges 
She was a free bird, free spirit. She was a free spirit. She was. Full of love. You know, love's the greatest was. power, and she was full of love. She was. She love. was very She was very kind, very loving. Mm -hmm. Like I said, everybody loved Ashley. She loved absurd things. Oh, she had, a, she, she had a terrible sense of humor about, like, what is it called? A dark sense of humor. She had the darkest sense of humor. Just, like, the most morbid things. Her and a sister of mine, too. She loved morbid. That's the thing I miss most about, like, her laughing, because she would giggle. About like things that she's somebody you couldn't sit next to at a funeral. Bro, I, I don't know. You guys say just there's something wrong about her and shit like that, and you guys are like making decisions about her. Like brother, brother, these are parents. One, and then so you don't know what that's like probably, and then two, this has suffered loss and trauma. You don't know what that's like either probably in that that gravity. Both these things combined, she might be smiling and laughing because she has thoughts of of of, uh, of her daughter and it reminds her of good things and positive things. Probably the only positive thing she has in her life going on, and makes her happy to think about that while she's talking about it. You know. Girl. You could not eat right. this. You said over there because you had me laughing. Everyone's going to be looking at me. <laughs> Ashley loved people. She saw the goodness in people. She really, really did so many times. Matter of fact, she's who helped me forgive my ex husband because I felt like he had really bailed on us. She was like, he wasn't ready to be a dad, mom. She had such a forgiving spirit in her giggle. I always will never forget her giggle. I thought I would at one point. I was grieving. <laughs> she had a funny giggle and she had love. And to honor her memory, I I choose love. I choose to forgive everyone who's made a mistake. Not that makes me lagging, not them. Just Sunny. I choose to live Ashley's joy because she had joy because she chose forgiveness. Because you know that's weighty. An autopsy confirmed Sunny's claim that he had shot Ashley eight times. She had wounds on most parts of her body except for her head, including her arms, legs, and chest. Despite the extent of her injuries, her death was not immediate. It was determined that Ashley's lungs had filled with blood, and she'd perished while her parents attempted to administer CPR before the ambulance arrived. However, her injuries were so severe that it was unlikely Ashley could have survived, even if help had arrived sooner. While their parents were likely grieving the massively traumatic death of one child at the hands of another, Sonny remains unbothered as ever. After learning of his sister's demise, Sonny simply checks his watch and goes back to talking with himself. I don't know, Chris is here. I think it's probably a um, very kind of family. It's an energy based like some like you know, like your arms telling us to look at us. Oh fuck this guy dude. Yeah, Netflix oh, fuck that was only work on you know it's ten years old. Six years old. Something like that. By the way, you know, it's and Windows 10, sure, I can gather the information, and even if it's not telling you when it's Windows 10. My cat's going for five goes. We've seen some blender. It's a lot of blender. I mean, I'm not sure what. It's got information. You can map in anywhere you to help. Even when officers arrive to take him to jail, he remains stoic. Press All right, still. Good to have you had today. That's a small risk, huh? Christopher, he's, uh, this deputy that's right behind you, he's going to take you up to our jail, get your fingerprinted and processed, and get the, uh, get the jail paperwork started on your charges, okay? We'll see in your stuff, all right? With Sonny detained, experts were left to ponder his blatantly absent motive. There seemed to be no reason for him to shoot and kill Ashley, and then attempt to kill his stepfather, Alan. So yeah, she was uh, my moral compass and my, my safety net and big sister, all of that. Experts could not come up with a full explanation for his actions, but they did develop a theory. It was possible that Sonny's abrupt, out-of-character violence was possibly caused by a psychotic episode. He didn't realize for a long time. It was probably eight months, maybe, before he even realized it. Most people will not like my answer, but the Sonny that night when this happened was my son's body, but it was not his spirit. Sonny was not there. Was there ever any kind of emotion on his face? Not for a year and a half. And, I and it was bad enough that he basically, while he was in the uh, juvenile hall, you know, waiting trial, he had no taste. Everything tasted like burning 
plastic. He had a psychological <laughs> snap. Something happened. They to explain to us later that everything yeah. tasted like burning plastic. I mean, out of respect for them and their loss, I'm not. Uh, I'm not gonna have a take on it. But I, I feel like it's. I feel like it's a little bit of like denial, and they want to say the best in their child, or whatever. But sometimes, like. Dude, I'm just saying, like... All the food he was eating... The only thing he could eat was plain, dry cereal. That's what he lived on. Mm -hmm. Sonny apparently told a psychologist that his memory of the murder felt like watching someone else or looking into a parallel dimension. I felt like the strings had been cut, for lack of a better word. This is the textbook definition of a depersonalization episode. Although a psychotic episode is a possibility, Sonny isn't showing any indications of psychosis in the interrogation room. He may be talking to himself, but this could be due to stress or nervousness. It's not sufficient to conclude that he's psychotic. Sonny shows no signs of delusional thinking, and he doesn't seem to be responding to hallucinations. His thought process is logical and coherent overall, though he demonstrated indications of a developmental delay like autism spectrum disorder. Typically, psychotic episodes are preceded by changes in behavior that would have been evident to his parents or other adults. Though this is not always the case. Sonny and Ashley's parents once again weigh in on this incredibly complicated aspect of the case. The thing I want people most to know is, is I know a lot of people have said since this has happened, you know, well, what about Ashley? And, and you know, why can you still be loyal to your son? I'm loyal to my son because... Like I said, he was not there. It was not done in some kind of malicious intent. There was no fight. There was no argument. There was no fuss. There was only love between him and his sister. There was nothing crazy going on, nothing funny going on. It was just unbelievable that it happened. And it's hard for me to even believe it now, even though I was probably the best witness mm, that was there the whole night that actually saw, I actually saw the most, mm. heard the most, pretty much knew the most because I knew what was going on from the sounds. I knew what it was. And I've stuck by Sonny. Me and his, his mom have stuck by Sonny, first off, because we love him and he's our son and we'd stick by him anyway. This was not something that, you know, was like in a fit of anger or it was not a planned out thing that Okay. Uh, you know, that he hated her or he was jealous of her or any of the stuff that they Made tried to say. Mind. They Made tried to mind. say that he was jealous because she was outgoing and he wasn't. I was a single mom and my ex-husband, I didn't have money. And he, this wonderful man wasn't in my life yet. And I think back about the time she had to babysit because I couldn't afford a babysitter and be at my shop. Because she babysat him, he holds so many character traits of her. And I know other people want him destroyed, but he's all I have left of her. Additionally, while awaiting trial at Regional Youth Detention Center, Sonny reportedly harmed himself multiple times by slamming his head into the wall and biting himself so hard that he broke a tooth. Eventually, he was diagnosed by several doctors with Asperger's, along with undisclosed disorders that are similar to schizophrenia. As a result of this potential diagnosis, Sonny's defense team attempted to have his confession dismissed, claiming that it was not given when he was of sound mind. The judge ruled that while the diagnosis could be valid, a psychotic episode or any of Sonny's other diagnoses would not impede his intelligence. He allowed the video of Sonny's interrogation to be played in full. The Brazels were not pleased by this decision and maintained that some aspects of the case were mishandled from the beginning, a few minutes later, an investigator showed up, and he was explaining the situation to me. He said, you know, we're going to take him down. He said, but we can't speak to him until his parents get there, you and your wife get there. It's crazy. They, they put him in the car. I never saw that, but I was in the front yard. Right. So they had already put him in the car by this time. They said, you know, they explained that they had to take him, you know, to, I guess, Columbia County Jail or whatever it was. So they took him to jail and uh, said, as soon as we finish up here and said, you know, we're going to call you and you'll have to come down so we can interview him, your son. But as you saw in the earlier footage, neither parent was present for Sonny's interrogation. Yeah, but by eight o'clock, we, we realized they're not going to talk to us at all. And so it's weeks before we can get any conversation with them. They, they even, to get Sonny a public defender, 
because he had he went into the indictment with no attorney. It was no probably, parental support, nothing. He was in there on his own. But we were begging to try to go, but they wouldn't let us. It was probably what a year later before we actually saw the video. The first court session that we went to, we immediately started calling the police department mm -hmm. and pretty much, you know, got no answers. They wouldn't really tell us anything. They told us that we couldn't talk to them because they charged him as an adult. And do you know that they didn't even give him a public defender for four weeks? Ultimately, in July of 2019, Sonny pleaded guilty by reason of mental illness to murder, aggravated assault, and two counts of possession of a firearm. He was sentenced to life in prison, plus 25 years, but will be eligible for parole in 30 years. Because he was convicted by reason of mental illness, he will continue to receive psychological counseling during that time. Sonny's parents continue to stand by him, and despite the terrible tragedy, the family has remained close. And he tells us all the time that he is very aware and very grateful that we are still his parents and that we love him and support him because he knows that there are a lot of people in there that lost all of their family ties and everything whenever whatever they did happened. He treasures it. He said, I want y'all to know. Yeah, and I'm, I'm an outsider, Chad, but you know, Chad, sorry, zero fucking... Dude, zero sympathy you do for fucking murder Andes, man. Fuck that guy. Oh, he said, you can't don't, ever know. Don't care. He don't said, care. how much that sorry. I appreciate it and everything. He said, of that Red you're Bozo. still Pussy my ass. mom and dad. You still support me. You never threw me away. You know, you never... He says he works so hard in there every day yeah. to be worthy of that. Right. In our exclusive interview, we asked Sonny if he remembered the day of his sister's death. I do, yes. It was terrifying for me. It's the strangest feeling, and it probably sounds ridiculous, and I know it will, but when I walked into my room, the second I walked through my door frame, there was a shift. There was something different. I couldn't really think. My body was moving, but I wasn't able to think. We asked how long it took for him to start processing what happened. I, I think I'm still struggling with it to this day. But I suppose okay. for the vast majority of it, I didn't speak for those first year. Yes, I believe in mental illness. I get that a lot. Okay. A lot of people like to corner themselves into, into this corner and say, yeah, but guys, mental illness, guys. But yeah, guys, I'm depressed though. But guys, because I'm, I'm anxious. Guys, I've, 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 I've... Okay. Millions and millions and millions of people on earth have fucking mental illnesses. Not all of them are fucking killers. And you end up killing people, you fuckwad. I hate this stupid ass fucking mentality of because I'm depressed, guys, I can fucking go out and do crazy shit. A lot of people struggle. A lot of people are in eternal pain. A lot of people cannot even fucking live with themselves, okay? And they don't go out and fucking kill people and do mass murder sometimes. You fucking degenerate. What's wrong with you? Four months when I was at the juvenile detention center, I, I still don't really know what to think. There's these times when I've broken down about it, but my brains like won't let me process it. Like every time I try and think about it, I still don't really process what's happened. I know empirically what's happened, but to this day, I don't understand why it happened. With this, we're yo. He didn't have schizophrenia. That's what they said. They said that he was he was he had other things that are undisclosed in the in the uh, sector of the. Uh, Fucking whatever it's called, fucking DSV, what the fuck, like a classification that that is um, straight up schizophrenia. That is not what they said. Response in mind, we DSMV. There you go. Asked Sonny if he worried that a similar incident could happen again if he was released. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Okay, it's always there. I, I was kind of eager to accept a plea deal already kind of consoled myself with the thought that I'll be spending the rest of my life in prison and I'm okay with that. And I, I don't really know if I want to be around my loved ones knowing that something like this could happen. On a lighter topic, we asked Sonny to tell us a bit about his life now and what his days look like. We normally eat breakfast at about seven o'clock in the morning. And for me, that's when I wake up. My activities used to be different. I used to teach a math class. But nowadays, mostly I just have self-studies, uh, write a few stories I like to read. I used to be really active going to the library. You know, uh, I've lost a lot of that energy now, and uh, most of my days are just spent idling, I suppose. 
We asked Sonny what people could learn from his circumstances, and he offered us some remarkable insight. If you do have a family member, a friend, son, daughter, child, whatever that is, uh, experiencing symptoms of disassociation, right? if they're too withdrawn from their environment or their surroundings, important that they be associated with something in the world. It's important to not let people get too far gone. Our final question was about Ashley and what Sunny would like all of us to know about her. She was one of those rare people in the world that cared out of her heart, and she didn't do things out of some desire for potential gain or benefit. She cared for everyone, regardless of whether or not she knew them. I have a lot of great memories of my sister. I'd say if there was one thing I'd want to remember is that she was, she was the kind of people that is very rare, genuinely cared about people around them, and I love her for it. I'll over for it now, now that I can truly appreciate what it means. We want to extend the utmost gratitude to Alan and Nicole Brazell for being so open and for allowing us to share their side of this heartbreaking case. True. I enjoyed the video. I enjoyed the video. Sorry. Um, a lot of people are misinterpreting what I said earlier. It's kind of making me mob. It's okay. I'm not going to write about it. Okay. You guys are jumping to the, to the conclusion that the person was mentally ill when it happened. The person was... Okay, they evaluated him. The guy didn't have any pre-existing or current um, things that are like pretty out there in terms of mental illness. It wasn't the psychosis. It wasn't whatever. It wasn't these, these, these big lines that other killers have, right? No, he didn't. No, he did not. Oh my God. Yeah, I'm over it. This chat, this chat is fucking about it. I'm over it. No, he did not. No, he did not. They didn't. Even after, even after he, he had like a couple things living on the line. You don't know if they developed like that. You don't know if that was after the fact. You don't know if. He developed some of these things after these things with the, the impact that it ended up having, having on them. And maybe his own uh, uh, processing of trauma, of his own deeds, of his own things, end up be becoming something. You don't know that. You have no idea. But as far as you can tell, there wasn't a lot of things that were happening before it even happened or during it. Like, holy shit, dude. You're, you're not. You're, you guys are losing your minds. They said in the video, he's already been listening. 